Hi, welcome back. In these last few sessions, we've talked about different investment philosophies. Value investors, we said, go after companies that are underpriced relative to their assets in place, investments they've already made. Growth investors, we said, look for companies where growth assets are being underpriced. You get growth at a reasonable or a cheap price. Even arbitrage investors basically try to find mispriced stocks within the market. And if you're an information trader, you're looking to take advantage of the fact that markets don't always react appropriately to information on individual stocks. What they all share in common is you're trying to pick individual stocks. You're not trying to time the market. In this session, I want to talk about an investment philosophy that's higher level, that rather than picking stocks, you try to time markets. You decide when to go into markets and when to go up. The best way to frame market time is to go back to a picture we looked at in the very first session, where I looked at the investment process. And I said the investment process starts with the client, where you tell me what your tax preferences are, how much risk you want to take on your tax status is, and I start to put together your portfolio. And there were three steps to putting your portfolio together. The first was the asset allocation decision. How much money am I going to put in stocks? How much in, in cash? How much in bonds? How much in real assets? That decision, if holding all its constants, should be determined, I said, by your risk aversion, your time horizon, and your tax status. Let me go back to that decision, though. It's true that allocating assets across different asset classes should be driven by your risk aversion, your time horizon, your tax status, but there is another factor that comes into play. If you believe you can time markets, if you can tell me when stocks are cheap or stocks are expensive, bonds are cheap or bonds are expensive relative to other asset classes, you might tilt your investment decision, your allocation decision to reflect that view. So if you think stocks are cheap relative to bonds, you might invest more into stocks than you otherwise would have. And that's what market timing is all about. Market timing philosophies are built around the asset allocation decision. Now note, you can also be a stock picker, but market timing is a higher level decision. It's a dec decision about asset allocation. Now I know that most investors, especially if they're old, old time value investors, we ask them, do you time markets, will tell you almost religiously that they're not market timers. Don't believe it for a moment. We're all market timers, whether we agree with, whether we agree agree to that characterization or not, at some point in time when investing, we time markets. We do it implicitly sometimes by holding back cash or explicitly by actually going out and timing markets. But market timing is built into every investor's gene pool. And here's the reason. If you can time markets, the payoff to market timing is immense. In fact, there are a couple of ways to illustrate this. One is if you look at the differences in returns across mutual fund managers, across money managers, across any kind of investment managers, what you find is the dominant factor that explains differences in returns across investors is not the stocks that they picked, how good they were as stock pickers, but how good they were in market timing. In other words, if you look at the returns over the last 20 years for 100 investors, the total returns on their total portfolios, I'll wager that 50, 60 percent of the differences in returns will be explained by where they put their money in the first place in terms of asset allocation rather than the individual stocks they pick. In fact, in a 1986 article, a group of researchers, and they raised the shackles of stock pickers by noting that 93.6 percent of the variation in quarterly performance across money managers could be explained by the mix that they brought to the process, stocks, bonds, and cash, not by the actual stocks they bought. In the years since, there have been people who have contested that number. But even those papers that have contested the number, for instance, an Ibbotson paper, finds that 50, you know, about 40, 50 percent of the differences in returns can be explained by that asset allocation choice that you make up front. So market timing clearly is a big driver of actual returns on portfolios. Here's a second way to think about the payoff to market timing. If you could time markets in a way that you could be out of the markets in bad months or bad periods, your returns as an investor would be much, much higher, right? In fact, Robert Schilling basically uh, did the study in 1992 where he went in and he looked at the returns you'd make as an investor, the annual returns if you, make, you could have made as an investor, if, if you could have stayed out of the market just during the bad months. Of course, we know only in hindsight what those bad months are. But he said, let's say you're a good enough market timer that you could tell when a bad month was coming. If you stayed out of the market for the 50 worst months between 1946 and 1991, 
your annual returns would have gone from about 11.2% to 19%. Think about it. Just the 50 worst months in a 45-year time period, your returns would have almost doubled if you'd been able to stay out of the market in bad months. So even if you could get only 25 of the 50 weakest or 30 of the 50 weakest, your returns are going to be immeasurably higher. So the reason we're all market timers is we know in our gut that we can successfully time markets. Our returns are going to be much, much, much higher than going out and picking stocks. So whether we like it or not, whether we, whether we accept that characterization or not, we're constantly looking for a market timing edge as investors, even if we call, even we call ourselves stock pickers. So the payoff to market timing is huge, and everybody does it. But there is a cost, and the cost can be large. We talked about what you gain by being out of the markets at the right time in all those weakest months. If you try to time markets, there's a danger that you might be out of the markets at exactly the wrong time. For instance, Bill Sharp said that if you could tell a good year from a bad year seven times out of ten, uh, only seven times out of ten, you should not try market timing because, in fact, if you look at the returns you would make if you if you try to time markets and you count the good years that you miss and the bad years, it turns out that much of the time the net effect is negative. You miss more good years than you, than you miss bad years. So at least empirically, even though you could see the story about why market timing pays off, in practice you tend to be out at exactly the wrong time. The second issue is transactions costs. If you're a market timer, almost by definition, you're going to face more transactions costs than if you're not a market timer because your portfolio's got to be moved a lot more over time to reflect your market timing views. So that has to be factored into the process as well because many of the studies you see that show that market timing works are before transactions costs. And the larger you are as an investor, the larger those transactions costs might be because you could have a price impact as you try to time markets. And the third issue is taxes. It's a well, well-known saying, but it's worth saying again, that investors get to spend after-tax returns, not pre-tax returns. And when you try to time markets, whether you like it or not, your tax liability is going to go up. Why? Because you're going to be taking capital gains on stocks you otherwise wouldn't have sold, but you have to sell because you have a market timing view. I know there are ways you can reduce these costs by using derivatives or other securities to kind of have your market timing views come in, but you're still going to face more in taxes if you're a market timer. So here's the net trade-off. The payoff, if you're a good market timer, is immense. The cost, if you're a bad market timer, is also immense. So if you're thinking about being a market timer, you at least to yourself have to believe that the benefits exceed the costs. And if you decide to go down this route and say, look, I'm going to be a market timer, there are five ways you can try to time markets. The first are what I call non-financial indicators, and they range the spectrum from, hum, you know, from you know, what people talk about at cocktail parties all the way to more reasonable indicators. There are technical indicators. We talked about charts and technical indicators used to pick stocks, resistance lines and support lines. Many of those indicators can also be used at the market level, at the overall market timing level to time the market. You could have mean reversion indicators, which basically assume that over time things always revert back to the way they used to be. So you could look at P-E ratios over time and argue that P-E ratios will revert back to that number. Interest rates over time and assume that interest rates over time would revert back to that number. But mean reversion indicators assume that things revert back to history. You could use macroeconomic variables. Ultimately, the market is supposed to be a reflection of the economy. So you could look at economic growth. You could look at interest rates, inflation rates, and see if there are pieces there that you can use to predict where the market's going to go in the next period. Or you could even be an intrinsic value investor. Just as you can do an intrinsic valuation of a company, you might be able to do an intrinsic valuation of the market and tell me whether markets are overpriced or underpriced. But ultimately, here's the bottom line. Whether you admit to it or not, you're, you're going to be timing markets at some point in time, you know, in, in, at least in terms of how you invest, you know, how much you invest in stocks and how much you hold back in cash. Because you're going to be doing it implicitly, might as well be explicit about it and be honest with yourself about how much market timing you're doing and at least do it in a systematic way. So that's what these next few sessions will be about, is coming, to a, uh, coming at least to a conclusion about what the best way for you to time markets might be, and looking at the overall evidence on different market timing approaches. Thank you very much for listening.